Jon Snow is also asking some difficult questions now on 4 in the first of our War Without End season of programs. In fact, the very concept of this war is on trial. Following the worst terrorist atrocity the world has ever seen, Britain and America are allies in war. On my orders, the United States military has begun strikes against Al-Qaeda terrorist training camps and military installations of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. The military action we are taking will be targeted against places we know to be involved in the Al-Qaeda network of terror or against the military apparatus of the Taliban. We will win this conflict by the patient accumulation of successes, by meeting a series of challenges with determination and will and purpose. As Britain's Chief of Defence Staff warns of the most difficult military operation since the end of the Cold War, we ask, is this assault a legitimate response to a terrorist outrage or a misguided attack that will only make matters worse? Tonight we put the war on trial. Good evening. It is a war like no other. The target, Osama bin Laden's Al-Qaeda terrorist network and its protectors, the Taliban. An enemy prepared to attack at the heart of America, first with the appalling events of September the 11th and more recently perhaps in a spate of anthrax attacks across the United States. But is the British and American response of airstrikes and military raids misguided and dangerous? Tonight, to launch Channel 4's War Without End season, a studio jury of 250, drawn from around the country and representative of the nation as a whole, will make its judgment. Our charge is that the war is misguided with no clear strategy or end. It exacerbates tensions between the West and the Muslim world, compounds the humanitarian crisis, and plays into the hands of the terrorist. Now, as with any trial, the prosecution will have to prove guilt beyond reasonable doubt. Otherwise, our studio jury must acquit. The team for the prosecution are Peter Oborn, political editor of The Spectator magazine, who has questioned the military strategy from a conservative viewpoint, and the feminist author, academic and cultural critic Germaine Greer, who is an active supporter of the Stop the War movement. Germaine Greer, what is your case against the war? is no antidote to terrorism. The terrible events of the 11th of September were intended to traumatize the Americans and to disrupt an already shaky world order. Terrorism exists to induce terror, which can make societies jettison the rule of law, curtail their own civil liberties, and lose their quality of life. America is like a man smashed in the face with a glass, who instead of seeking medical attention is trying to blow up the pub. We have been locked into a cycle of atrocity. We must jump the tracks that the terrorists have laid for us. We have to come up with a better idea. Thank you, Germaine Greer. Now for the defence, we have Rosemary Reiter, assistant editor of The Times and an expert on international security issues. She would now be in Central Asia doing research on conflict in the region had it not been for the events of September the 11th. And the journalist David Aronovich, who has used his regular uh, columns in the independent newspaper to argue the case for military action. David Aronovich, the case please for the defence. <laughs> Good old Germain, always so certain about novels, about movies, about wars. I'm not certain, and I'm not going to pretend that I am. I simply think that Germain doesn't get it, and I sometimes wonder if I do. We haven't seen this before. We've not caught up yet to the desperate reality of what September the 11th represents. The mind almost rejects it. I'm not talking here about stewardesses with their throats cut, or mums with kids told they were going to die, or the people jumping from the World Trade Center. 
It's the knowledge that, unlike with other forms of terrorism and insurgency that we've seen, this one targets third parties and kills utterly indiscriminately. If there had been 100,000 people killed in the World Trade Center debacle, it would have been more of a success for the terrorists who carried it out. They see and they have no limit. If they have biological weapons, they will use them. They may already have done so. UN Security Council, in Resolution 1373, had a three-strand strategy, not a one, diplomatic, humanitarian and military. We're only discussing the third because that's the way Channel 4 wanted it. Well, very well. Your time I is... that challenge. I loathe war. I get no boy's own thrill from it. But if you want to stop September the 11th and its 57 other lethal varieties David, being visited on our cities, up. then that's part of what we have to do. Thank you, David Aronovich. Central to the prosecution case is the charge that military action is misguided in the battle against terrorism. Peter Oborn, for the prosecution, will you please call your first witness? Uh, I call George Galloway MP. George Galloway is a backbench Labour MP with a long-standing interest in the Middle East. He's been leading the campaign within Parliament against the war. George Galloway, I stand on the right of the political spectrum. You stand on the left. But on this, for the first time in both our lives, perhaps, we, are, we agree on one thing, that this war is a terrible mistake. What should we have done? We should have followed the legal route. There was no intention, it now transpires, to actually achieve the extradition and trial of the man accused, Osama bin Laden. Bush parroted at the beginning that we would bring him to justice. Then it became dead or alive. Now it's dead. And both the President and the Prime Minister have made it clear that they don't expect him to be brought out alive from Afghanistan. We should have followed the Lockerbie route, which would have meant producing evidence, and none has yet been produced even to the British Parliament. If such evidence did exist, in my opinion, it would be being plastered on our walls. George Galloway, both of us agree that a terrible crime was committed. The United States of America should have done something, but is this a legitimate response? Well, it's actually counterproductive as well as morally grotesque for the richest, most powerful people in the world to be bombing the poorest, most ragged and hungry. But it's counterproductive because the flames are everywhere from Gaza to Jakarta. More people hate us more intensely now than they did a few weeks ago. And that's very unlikely to make us more secure. Peter Obon, thank you very much. Uh, David Aronovich, your chance now to cross-examine George Galloway. You say that we should have followed the legal route. Actually, of course, UN Security Council Resolution 1373 actually does give legal authority to what is being done in Afghanistan, doesn't it? We asked for extradition from the Taliban, but we didn't provide them with any evidence, and we only stuck at that for three weeks. My point is, if we had followed the diplomatic and legal path, we could have avoided ragged, hungry people being dragged burning out no, no, of buildings no, sorry, in Kabul. Sorry, I'm, 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 well, I'm well aware of the rhetorical force of your argument. I'm trying to get at some of the logic of it. Mm. Um, you said that the legal route wasn't followed. It wasn't followed. After, after, the, the, after the attacks on the American embassies in 1998, the UN requested from the Taliban that there should be an extradition of bin Laden. Did they extradite him? They didn't provide any evidence to the Afghan government excuse me, either. Excuse me, the UN asked for extradition. Did no, they extradite him? No country in the world, however ragged it is, and the Taliban's a pretty ragged one, I knew that when I was trying to stop them coming to power, any government requires the presentation of evidence before it will expel someone on a capital charge to face the electric chair in a hostile country. So you think the United States didn't do so, so you on think either the occasion. You think the Taliban were right not to extradite bin Laden after the, Look, after the bombings don't, of September 1998, don't, don't in, try which, in which over 200 black African people, as well as other people right. at the American embassies, were killed. You think they were don't, right not to do that? Don't try and hang bin Laden on me. He's a British and American invention, not mine. Nothing no. to do with the left. No, 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 that's perfectly true. You're, uh, that's perfectly true, George Galloway. Your friends are elsewhere. In The Guardian, in uh, April 10th, 2001, you said of the things that you had done during the first uh, Labour, Party, for the Labour Party administration, I stood firmly against the new imperialism and Anglo-American aggression around the world. Why aren't you proud mm -hmm. to stand up against other aggressions? Your friends are elsewhere too, of course. You were a hardline communist before you shaved your beer off because it was tickling Tony's backside. <laughs> Since uh, I'm not going to bother to refute that, largely because I've never been hardline in my entire life. You were life, a hardline communist you. when I first met you, no, what no, do you mean? No, no. You were a Communist Party member Indeed, for years. Was, well, let's talk about what you are, George You were a Galloway. Communist Party member for years. The Associated, the Associated Press, and I read, from November 1999, 
Aziz, this is Deputy Foreign Minister, Deputy Prime Minister Tariq Aziz, with whom you spent Christmas 1999, yes. said, made the remarks as he and other senior Iraqi leaders gave a hero's welcome to British Labour Party legislator George Galloway, who arrived in Baghdad to highlight the plights mm. of Iraqis mm. under UN sanctions. Young girls sang pr the praises of Saddam as they showered Aziz uh, and Galloway uh, with roses and offered dates and yoghurt, symbols of, of, of warm they, welcome. They may have, How must they the Kurds have, they, have been choking on they, the yoghurt and roses that they, you were showered with in Saddam's they name? They may have. They may have, you, they may have sung hymns of praise to leaders. I don't, but you do. No, no, no. You've been doing it no, for no, the no, last no, no. ten years. No, no, you most certainly you do. Threw your it's, Communist it's, Party card away. I have, I have never spent Christmas with a mass murderer and somebody no, who could but be. But you're in bed with somebody, George W. Bush. I say, so you you're think, in bed with George W. Bush. So uh, let's George, be absolutely clear. You're in bed with George W. Let's Bush. Be, let's be absolutely clear. George, 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 George Galloway, George Galloway, 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 Galloway,
the game's virtually finished. I would have thought the Taliban were a tougher proposition than the Somali warlords, and the Americans couldn't even topple them. This is true, but this was an Osama bin Laden operation designed to humiliate the American foreign policy by introducing body bags. America now has to go beyond body bag phobia and fight on the ground. I think Michael Griffin, and uh, thank you very much indeed, Germain. Michael Griffin, thank you. <laughs> so now, given that the Allies are pursuing a military strategy, is it the right one? Or do they risk uh, being sucked into a much longer campaign with no clear definition of victory? We'll hear the arguments after the break. <laughs> This is the direct drive in Telewasher from LG. It's spinning at its top speed of 1400 RPM. Does it vibrate less than your old washing machine? We'd put money on it. With its intelligent protection system, the Ford Mondeo is one of the safest places to be. With delivery before Christmas, this luxurious three-seater leather sofa is now below half price. Just one of the amazing opening offers in the Courts Express delivery sale. Central to the defence case in this trial is the argument that the military strategy is clear, though results will take time. Rosemary Reiter, for the defence, would you please call your next witness? I call Air Marshal Sir Tim Garden. Air Marshal Sir Tim Garden, a former assistant chief of the defence staff, he is now a visiting professor at the Centre of Defence Studies, King's College, London. Air Marshal, you have a well-earned reputation as the thinking man's soldier. There are two campaigns here, aren't there? The worldwide hunt by intelligence and security agencies and the military campaign in Afghanistan. What can military force achieve? I think that's a very important point. 6,000 people were murdered on September the 11th, and we need to stop that bit happening again. It could be worse next time. So the battle at home in America and Europe is in many ways more important than the one that's going on for the long-term strategy. What we can do in Afghanistan is we can destroy the training network that's almost completed. We can search out and get the retribution to those that organized it, that is, uh, bin Laden and his terrorist leadership. And we can dissuade other states from supporting terrorism by uh, attacking the Taliban government. And we can make the conditions right so that Afghanistan can be rebuilt so that it doesn't spawn new terrorist activities. Those are the goals, Air Marshal. But is the military strategy, in your view, a coherent one? It's absolutely a coherent one, but the trouble is that there are those different strands to it. We watch what we can see on the television, which is only a limited amount of what is going on. We don't see the security services at home and the protective measures. We mustn't see those because that would make them less effective. We see those measures that make good filming for the television in Afghanistan. We've already destroyed the network. We are now continuing with the finding of bin Laden, which needs more intelligence. Who knows how long that will take? And we need to re reconfigure the government in Afghanistan in order to be able to put in the humanitarian aid and stop support for terrorism. That may take a very long time. Rosemary Reiter, thank you. Peter Oborn, for the prosecution, your cross-examination, please. Uh, so, Tim, you've just said you, we've already destroyed the network. Can you just clarify what net, not the Al-Qaeda network? I, what I meant was the infrastructure that was used for training 10,000 terrorists who are now either in Europe... But not the, the Al-Qaeda network, just wanted to clarify that. No, no, it's the that. infrastructure I'm talking Yesterday, about. something very important, very interesting was said uh, by the Chief of Staff, which you'd have read, that this actually isn't really a war against a palpable, tangible opposition. It's a war of ideas. It's like the Cold War. If that is so, why are we bombing? What are we bombing? You can't bomb an idea, can we? We are we're trying to ensure that you are not a threat when you sit in this building 
uh, of an aircraft coming and hitting you. That requires many strands of activities, of which one of them is removing the leadership of the organisation and stopping them training more terrorists. Now, I think we're, we're on the same side, of course, about that. Absolutely. We, 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 both of us, all of us, everybody in this room wants to remove this terrible Al-Qaeda threat. But what it, how, what the objective seems so unclear. Do we, we don't even know, do we, where... Bin Laden is. I can give you the objectives again. I gave them. When I we said, started, do we know where Bin Laden is? No, of course is. we don't. We, we don't know where he is. Do we know, even know if he's in Afghanistan? I, I think we're fairly sure. We, we're fairly sure. We think he might be. And, hmm? and, and we would need. And if we, we did, did know, let us just, just, just get it. No, thank you for let that. You don't question. know where he is. You think he might be in Afghanistan. If he, even if he was in Afghanistan, I'd like to quote something you wrote in the Independent newspaper. The smartest bomb cannot seek out individuals by. So even if he was, we couldn't get him. No, that's not true. No, what, what I said was that you will need more than air power uh, we'll in order to find him. But you need, right, you need to set... The, can, can I just yeah. explain what I said in that newspaper article, since you didn't finish reading it? You can... <laughs> you can provide the air power that you need in order to be able to gain the intelligence to put in the search-and-destroy missions that you need with ground troops. That is being prepared for now. For millennia, our marshal. There have been invasions of Afghanistan for millennia, every single one. We're not one talking about invasions. On the ground, ground troops. It's just what you were talking about. No, we're not. Excuse we're talking me. about search and destroy operations using small specialist forces. Oh, no, all right. The, we're supposing that these small specialist forces, which you optimistically think will work, get rid of bin Laden. I, I just you like read to, the article. You said, you, I, I would like to I ask you another question, please, uh, Marshall. And that is, do you agree with the US Defense Secretary, who said that I'm quoting now, even if bin Laden were gone tomorrow, the same problem would exist. I agree totally with that. So, in other words, so there is that, no point in this exercise. That's, that's, that's not true. <laughs> uh, uh, if, you, if you eliminate the head of an organisation, that doesn't mean that the organisation can't reform and do more damage. Therefore, you need to do both. And that's why there are so many different strands to this but This activity. organisation, surely you will agree with everybody in this room, it, doesn't, it isn't just in Afghanistan. Exactly. Mainly it's much, those terrible atrocities were carried out from the United States. Which is why that part of the battle is so important, and I said that at the start. We need to attack it on all the different fronts, and this is a complex problem, and you only see on your television screens a small part yeah. of the way this is being addressed. But what's, so Tim Garden, that's, I'm afraid, our time. Thank you very much indeed. Now, at the very heart of tonight's charge is the claim that military action has compounded an already appalling humanitarian crisis within the region. Jermaine Greer, for the prosecution, will you please call your next witness? I call Roger Riddell. Roger Riddell is the International Director of Christian Aid, a relief agency that works in the region. He's led calls for a pause in the bombing. Mr Riddell, would you give us an idea, please, of the scope of the aid operation in Afghanistan and the nature of the present problem? Afghanistan houses some of the poorest people on our planet. They have been inflicted with three years of drought. There are now between five and seven and a half million people on the verge of starvation. It is essential that aid is brought to these people, particularly now as winter is enclosing and snow will come and it will be almost impossible to reach people, particularly in the mountains. We have seen in Afghanistan in the last few months, before the events of the 11th September, people having to scratch for grass to mix with small amounts of flour and water to make meals. People are eating leaves and fodder that is normally given to cattle. Livestock have been pushed down to almost zero. The water table in some areas has dropped 20 meters. People cannot get access to safe water. In a camp just west of the city of Herat where we're working, whereas we saw one to two deaths of children from starvation in April, in August, the first week of August, 20 a week were dying, young children. Now tell me what, in your opinion, has been the impact of the military action on this already grave situation? Well, it's not only the military impact, it was the threat of military and particularly bombing before it even took place. People were understandably fearful and frightened about being bombed. 
we warned before it took place that it would lead to a drop in the activities of aid agencies to reach the people. Roger. When the bombing started, uh, we said what we need is a pause in the bombing to enable the food to get in. Currently, in the last week, only one quarter of the food needed seven and a half million people is getting into the country. Roger Riddell there, we must leave it and hand it over now for cross-examination from David Aronovich. Roger, uh, just so that I'm clear, one alternative would be for the Taliban to hand over bin Laden to the, uh, to the UN. Um, are you calling upon the Taliban to do that? We are independent humanitarian agencies, pledged and committed to meet the humanitarian needs of the people. We are pledged as signatures to the International Code of the Red Cross not to engage in political debate. We have to maintain independence, and we call upon the Taliban and all the forces in the conflict to provide independent humanitarian space to meet the needs of these people who are short of food. Oh, absolutely. I don't think there's any problem from the Allies' side about trying to provide those corridors. What we're talking about is the circumstances under which a humanitarian crisis could be averted. Do you agree that one of the ways in which it could be averted would be the handing over of bin Laden? We certainly think that it is necessary to address the wide and complex issue of terrorism. There are certainly uh, links between the Taliban and bin Laden, but we have worked for 15 years with the Taliban. We try to negotiate and have successfully done that to get the aid through. Isn't there a slight danger that because the Allies are reasonable and the Taliban aren't, all your demands get placed upon the Allies and not upon the Taliban? Isn't that a danger? Well, it could be a danger, but we appeal to each of the parties involved. The United Nations itself has said we have two or three weeks before winter sets in to get the okay. aid in. Roger. Um, the f aid that was being going in was being stolen significantly before the airstrikes, wasn't it? 1,640 tonnes stolen in Kandahar before the airstrikes actually began by the Taliban. That's correct, isn't it? There the has they were been pilfering. There was not pilfering. This is wholesale looting, isn't yes, it? Yes, and there have also been, there's also been evidence of the, ha uh, of the Taliban handing back food as well. And is the situation is difficult and complex, and we have to try and steer our way through. Sure. Because if we don't... There are tens of thousands but of people who are going to suffer and be vulnerable <laughs> to death. My last, my, last, my last question to you is, taking that point on board, isn't it the case, because you didn't mention this, that most of the refugees who are coming to the borders of Pakistan and Iran are giving as the reason why they are shifting, not the Allied bombing, but in fact forced conscription by the Taliban and the forces of the Northern Alliance? Isn't that the case? There have, there have I, have the, I have the latest UNHCR reports and reports from the Relief Web here. There have been reports of that. Certainly, uh, we have people stationed in Pakistan. We also have people stationed in Iran. And the information that we're getting is that people are coming in for fear and terror and lack of food. But you Roger Riddell, there we must leave it. David Aronovich, thank you. Thank you, Roger. The prosecution claim that the Allies' offensive is playing into the hands of bin Laden by increasing antagonism between the Islamic world and the West. Peter Obon, for the prosecution, your next witness, please. Professor Halle Ashfar. Professor Halle Ashfar from the uh, Department of Politics at York University is an expert on the Middle East and the author of books on Islamic fundamentalism. Um, I would like to put to you the question which John Snow just said. Is it true that we are playing into the hands of Osama bin Laden. It's certainly the case. If you actually heard the news today, there are now 10,000 young men prepared to go into Afghanistan in order to fight the jihad. Now, the Muslim world is very reluctant to actually see bin Laden as its, rep as its representative. <laughs> and yet it has no choice, given this, the current situation. No Muslim country can actually side publicly with the West. Even Musharraf this morning asked for, a, asked for a political solution because there is no way that we can accept this kind of attack. Do you think that we are jeopardizing the stability of moderate Arab states by our actions in Afghanistan? We are certainly jeopardizing the situation of allies of the West. Saudi cannot even consider accepting the visit by the Prime Minister of Britain. 
Uh, I think that the situation of Pakistan is extremely dangerous. But even if we actually it's a look... It's nuclear power, of course, and so if it did fall, they would have... A terrorist could have nuclear weapons, is that right? Well, exactly, and actually the difficulty is that the Pakistani army has at least 30% of the army uh, backing the Taliban, and if Musharraf falls, then the dangers would be very, very serious. And one final question I wonder if I could ask you. The Prime Minister and George Bush are saying, and they are so right, that this isn't a war against Islam, but aren't we creating by our actions an impression that it is? Unfortunately, you are. I regret to say that when I actually announced at a meeting yesterday that there were a thousand Muslims in the towers as well as the 7,000 others, no one knew about it because we are being seen as the enemy within. And many of us are not the enemy, but I wish we could avoid this kind of labels. Thank you so much. Rosemary uh, Reiter for the defence. Your cross-examination, please. Professor Ashbar, you know that that has been well reported, how many Muslims there were in the towers. They've been reported in my paper, they've been reported in David's paper, in the FT, that's been reported on television. The whole world has wept with all those in the tower, including Muslims. And in this country, there is immense sympathy for the predicament of brave people like you who have fought for many years, and I applaud it, against the oppression of women, first in Iran and now in Afghanistan. But you say, we are playing with this action into bin Laden's hands, doing what he wanted. Do you mean that his purpose was to destroy the Taliban? No, I mean that his purpose was to destroy the alliances that existed between the Middle East and the West. Look, he actually the begun logic of his action was that he was prepared to see military retribution in Afghanistan on the Taliban and on Al-Qaeda, which is indissolubly linked to Al-Taliban. Either he was not prepared for that, in which case he is losing ground and not gaining ground, or else he was prepared for it. It can't be both ways. Well, let me put it, it to you. It was either suicidal or else it was a mistake. Let me put it to you. We have a group of Saudis and Lebanese who actually caused these atrocities. You then go and bomb the, the Afghanis. There's been no Afghani identified as a terrorist. And you go and actually kill the Afghans because the Arabs have done something to the Americans. How do you expect this to be seen as fair? How, do you can, how can you imagine the weren't, Middle East is feeling? Weren't you just talking about the 10,000 foreign volunteers who are rushing into Afghanistan? Exactly, and why and are they rushing there? And what about the people who the Afghans themselves call the Arabs who are calling the military shots in Afghanistan? And by the way, if it is 10,000 volunteers, actually, um, on question time a few weeks ago, you said it was three million, so they're not making much ground, are no, they? No, I did not did say that the there were three program. millions. I said that there was support. But the news today says it's 10,000, and what I'm actually saying, and I wish that you wouldn't misquote me intentionally, but what I'm actually saying is that you and the actions of the West at the moment makes it impossible. Musharraf today asked for a political situation. You actually have someone uh, trying to make some kind of peace, some kind of political action before you go in. And, and you, don't, you don't allow, you don't give peace a chance. There you actually the play Taliban into the hand of Bin The Taliban have been given many, many chances for peace, as you when, know well. When and they were have they given a chance? What kind they of a chance were they given? They, they have were just repeatedly, bombed out of existence. They have it's not the Taliban which are being supported bombed. acts of war acts of international terrorism designed to kill and maim, and they have embraced um, Al-Qaeda and bin Laden as their honoured guests. Can I just now, put it to you? Now, you say you want the Taliban out of yes, Afghanistan, of course. I think. Yes, of course. They're not going to resign, are they? No. <laughs> Otherwise, they wouldn't have hanged the war hero sent by the but king yesterday. But you're not giving them a chance to actually be pushed out. Well, that is the chance in their lives. Professor Afshar there. I'm afraid we must leave it. Rosemary Reiter, thank you very much. <laughs> Defence, David Aronovich, your next witness, please. Yes, I call James Rubin. James Rubin is a former Assistant Secretary of State to the American government where he advised President Clinton on foreign policy. James Rubin, 
you are actually linked with the previous Democratic administration of Bill Clinton. Maybe, like me, when you saw George Bush go into the White House, little shivers of fear ran up and down your spine. You weren't sure what to expect. Do you think, from your slightly different perspective, that the Bush administration has surprised the world by its restraint rather than by adopting a cowboy stance, which was what a lot of us rather expected? I do. I think by gathering together an incredible and truly unprecedented group of countries, China, Russia, uh, many countries around the world, India, and now turning uh, President Musharraf to become an ally in the war on terrorism rather than aiding and abetting those who were supporting terrorism. This is an incredible coalition. It was put together very carefully by Colin Powell, the Secretary of State. He didn't rush to use military force in the days after the bombing and waited until uh, he had put together an incredible degree of support, including UN uh, resolutions supporting this kind of action. Now, let me put this to you. The United States has made terrible policy blunders in the past. Um, we're talking now about a three-strand strategy of which one is diplomatic, one is military, and the third is humanitarian. Can you assure us that this time the policy is not bomb and go? Have you learned from the mistakes of the past? Well, I think it's fairly well established, and certainly in retrospect it's clear that uh, after the Soviet Union was expelled from Afghanistan, a vacuum was created. The United States and most of the Western world averted their eyes from the chaos that was resulting, did very little to clean up some of the problems we participated in. I believe getting the Soviet Union out of Afghanistan was an important goal, but continuing to pay attention to Afghanistan uh, was not pursued. I think this time, President Bush has uh, made very clear in something that wasn't easy for him to say, namely that he wants to work with the United Nations to help Afghanistan reconstruct and reestablish a legitimate uh, government and have the construction of infrastructure return. That Germaine is a long-term commitment. Germain Greer, your opportunity to cross-examine. Uh, when you say uh, help Afghanistan reconstruct, uh, do you mean reconstruct after the damage caused by the Allies or just generally reconstruct? Well, I think for, for, those, for those people who are familiar with Afghanistan as it was prior to September 11th, the various 15 years of war had pretty much destroyed all of its infrastructure. One of the issues the Allies are having trouble with is trying to identify uh, locations that aren't already been destroyed by the Soviet invasion and the civil war that took place there. If the United States and the other countries get together and rebuild what will have been 17 long years of war, uh, that will make the people of Afghanistan live a far, far better life than they would have prior to September 11th. It seems as if you might be slightly uh, favorably disposed to the notion that if Afghanistan had been aided materially to develop and to actually develop a reasonable standard of living, fanaticism might have taken less hold and it might be in the mess that it's in now. We could have had an aid offensive 15 years ago. Well, certainly I think what I'm suggesting is that that would have been useful. Whether or not that would have changed the minds of madmen like Osama bin Laden who believe in killing uh, mass murder uh, live on television, thousands and thousands <coughs> of people, I don't think so. Would it have made it easier to get support in that part of the world to combat Osama bin Laden? Probably. Would it have stopped Osama bin Laden and his mad ideology? Probably not. Um, I think it's risky to give so much importance to a, a single person. But generally speaking, uh, terrorists inhabit societies whether they like it or not. Terrorists have lived in England. Terrorists, God knows, have lived in Ireland. Not by the consent of the people. The terrorists are not the Afghanis' fault, are they? But the infrastructure that's being destroyed is does belong to them. It's well, their country. Uh, actually, the government, to the extent you accept that term in Afghanistan, is the Taliban. And they have not only welcomed Osama bin Laden, they have been helped by him, and they have helped him. And the fact is that the leadership in Afghanistan knew full well that this man was planning and orchestrating mass murder around the world, and they refused to do anything about it. For years and years and years, we tried to get them to expel these people, and they decided that their support and their uh, fraternal 
uh, ideology with the bin Laden organization was more important than getting food and support for the people of Afghanistan. They made that decision, the Taliban, not the Western world. Very brief question, Jermaine. Last one. Thank you. James Rubin, thank you very much. After the break, we hear the case for the war from a British government minister. And our studio audience reaches its verdict. Will they convict or acquit? <laughs> got to have shiny alloy wheels, power steering, sunroof. It's got to look good and be fun to drive. So there was only one thing for it, a Ford Fiesta flight. For just £99 a month at 5.9% APR, it's all the car I ever wanted, at a price I can afford. Burning. Acid heartburn. Gaviscon advance. Coating. Cooling. Soothing. That's better. Gaviscon advance. Our advanced answer to acid heartburn. We've heard the prosecution case that the war in Afghanistan is misguided with no clear strategy or end. And their charge is that it has exacerbated tensions, compounded the humanitarian crisis and given a propaganda victory to the terrorists. David Aronovich, for the defence, would you please call the final witness? Yes, I call Ben Bradshaw. Ben Bradshaw MP joins us from his Exeter constituency, former broadcast journalist. He's now the Foreign Office Minister responsible for the Middle East and international security. Ben Bradshaw, two and a half years ago you stood where I'm standing now, didn't you, and took part in a debate on Kosovo, the Kosovo War, in which your opponent was Germaine Greer, as she's mine today. And you'll recall that at that stage, she said on the 25th of May, this bombing of Yugoslavia is absolutely useless and will achieve nothing. Can you tell me what happened 12 days later? Yes, uh, Milosevic sued for peace. Uh, we stopped his genocide and ethnic cleansing in Kosovo. The Muslim refugees who we fought to protect returned to their homes. And since then, as we all know, Milosevic has been hauled before an international court in The Hague. Ms Greer was wrong then, and I'm afraid she's wrong now. Now, <laughs> the fact that she was wrong then doesn't actually prove to anybody that she's wrong now. One of the things that could prove her right is if the government is not serious about the Marshall Plan for aid to Afghanistan and the peace plans which should be made in Palestine stroke Israel and in the area of the Middle East. Is the government actually serious about these strands of the new world order that it's talking about or is it just so much flannel? It is a complete myth what the prosecution have alleged today that we've only become interested in Afghanistan since, since September the 11th. I chaired back in July a major international conference. Britain and the United Nations have been involved, engaged in the humanitarian relief effort in Afghanistan for years, as has the United Nations, as we've heard, been trying for years to get the Taliban to extradite bin Laden, to no effect. And at the beginning of the programme, Ms Greer said that, uh, rather plaintively, I thought, we need a better idea. But what she and the prosecution have totally failed to come up with during this programme is a better idea, an explanation how they would bring to justice the terrorists and how they, pre they would prevent similar crimes or even worse crimes being com committed in the future. But let me, let me push you on the point that I asked you. Are you serious about a plan of, of significant dimensions? There, there has already been tremendous progress. The United Nations asked for, I think it was $500 million dollars we more than exceeded that amount of money uh, within days. Uh, the United Nations has appointed a, an extremely senior and well-respected special envoy, Lakhda Brahimi, who will be in charge of the post-Taliban nation building in Afghanistan. He's involved, as we are being broadcast now, in diplomatic efforts in the region to build a consensus both among Afghanistan's neighbours, the opposition groups within the country and those opposition groups in Minister, exile as to how to move things forward. Sorry to interrupt you, but uh, right. time is tight and I must offer it now to uh, 
the prosecution. Peter Oborn. Minister, thank you very much for coming here and answering our questions. I wonder if you could clarify one point about the objectives of the war, which is what, the, 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 what our, our American allies are saying now, that this war, to quote Dick Cheney, may never end in our lifetime. Why hasn't this, your government been as candid with the British people as the Americans have been with theirs? Well, we've always said, Peter, as has the United Nations in those two unanimous resolutions, that the campaign against terrorism will never end. I said it will go on and on and on, and on as never, long as terrorism it, exists. Sorry, but the, can, the can this? What we're talking about, I'm, excuse me, what I was asking you about was the British and American presence in Afghanistan and bombing raids. The, uh, how long are, these, are they prepared to go on? Well, the immediate aim of the international community, and it's wrong uh, constantly to refer to Britain and America, this is United Nations no, that we are the two nations currently involved in military a, action. With the support of an unprecedented international coalition. The action will go on until we have brought those to justice who were responsible for the mass murder that occurred on September the 11th. And their ability to commit similar crimes again, and you have offered absolutely no alternative to what is currently being contemplated. We have indeed. <laughs> Minister, with, um, with great respect, we have been doing precisely that most of, this, uh, most of this evening. I will ask you, though, the next question. I'd like to put to you a quote from Paul Wolfovich, who, as you know, is um, a very influential voice in the Bush administration and deputy to Wansfeld. And it was the, his this We are not going to pick off individual terrorist snakes. We are going to drain the entire swamp. That's what he said on Wednesday. Now, your boss, uh, Jack Straw, has made absolutely clear that widening of this bombing agenda, of this fight ground, ground war agenda, is not going to go beyond Afghanistan. Are we shoulder to shoulder with the United States? Well, we're shoulder to shoulder with the United Nations and the whole of the international community. I said shoulder community. to shoulder with the United States. We are do, shoulder we share, uh, do you agree, do you support what the... Uh, the deputy to Donald Rumsfeld says that we are going to go for widening, or do you, I do support your own boss, Jack Straw, when he said we're not. I'm more interested in supporting what the official American government line is. Sounds to me it's a bit of a shambles, if you ask me. No, it's not, because and you're I can, quoting I can somebody put on another the fringes of the US please. administration. Uh, sorry, am I going to be allowed to answer that question? The immediate aims of this military action are absolutely clear, and I've repeated them uh, probably twice already, I'll do so again. It's to bring to justice those who committed the mass murder of September no, 11th. You've heard, your, you've heard that already, so again. can I ask you another question? Um, I'd like to put to you a quote from uh, uh, an Afghan refugee in the Telegraph last week. He said, we hate the Taliban, we are pun being punished for a government we could not choose. Now this is the thing, isn't it? There have been over a hundred civilian deaths now. And why are these people who did not choose the Taliban being killed, maimed, murdered and so forth? It's well, you, you know, Peter, as well as I do, that uh, every effort is being taken, unlike by Al-Qaeda, whose aim is to maximise innocent civilian casualties in their crimes. Every effort is being taken by the coalition to avoid right. unnecessary So, so that is why casualties. you're using cluster minister, bombs. No, I'm sorry, we're, time is up, and uh, I'd like to thank the Minister Ben Bradshaw very warmly for uh, uh, giving us his testimony. Thank you. We've heard the case for and against the war. It is now time for our audience to reach a verdict. Uh, they must decide whether the Allies are guilty or innocent of the charge. But before they vote, we'll hear two brief closing statements. First, for the prosecution, Peter Obom. This war played straight into the hands of Osama bin Laden. We British of all people should know that defeating terrorism by salutary punishment is hopeless. Our bitter experience with the IRA shows that. Reprisals only make things worse. This war is between Old and New Testament. It is between those who value human life and those who do not. Mr Blair and Mr Bush are ch Christians. They might ask how Christ would have acted. He would never have sh shed innocent blood. That is what terrorists do. If we do the same, we sink to their level and Osama bin Laden wins. Thank you, Peter Oborn. Rosemary Reiter, your closing statement for the defence, please. Members of the jury, we are confronted by Mass Murder Incorporated.
This is Al-Qaeda's war, not America's. Suicide bombers are its remote controlled weapons. More attacks are planned. You cannot dissuade people who think like bin Laden. You can only make it much harder to act. War is ugly and it is dangerous, but if we do not, in self-defense, destroy these utterly ruthless terrorists, they will take that as proof of impotence or of fear. They will have won. If Al-Qaeda is not crushed, it will strike again. Harder if it can, anywhere. It is planning to do so. So as you vote, think about the consequences. If you vote against l using force, you should hope for all our sakes that no one listens to you, because if they did, and bin Laden struck again, we in this room would have blood on our hands. Rosemary it could Wright. be the blood of someone you know. It could be yours. Think about it. Rosemary Wright, thank you very much. Now, our audience of 250 drawn from across the country and vetted by a national polling organization, it's time to reach your verdict. Each of you has an electronic console with a yes button and a no button. The charge tonight is the war is misguided with no clear strategy or end. It exacerbates tensions between the West and the Muslim world, compounds the humanitarian crisis and plays into the hands of the terrorist. If you're convinced that the Allies are guilty, then vote yes. If you have any reasonable doubt, you must acquit and vote no. So what is your verdict? Please vote now. While all the votes appear to be in, the jury has reached their judgment. Let's see the result. Very level pegging, and it's too close to call. That's an absolutely fascinating result. Our audience are clearly deeply divided on this most complicated of conflicts. Clear then that if the government is to sustain support for military action, the public will want to see early results coming through. Without them, the early public endorsement of the war could soon start to wane. Thank you to our advocates for the prosecution, for the defense, and to our witnesses, and especially to our audience and you at home. Good night. And our War Without End season continues with an Equinox special on germ warfare. Bioterror is tomorrow night at 8, here on 4.